Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here at the KESS seminar series. Um, it's always great to have an opportunity to present our results to different audiences and I know we've got quite a mixture uh, of people in the group today or in the audience today so hopefully you'll find what we have to share with you of interest. Um, so I'm here as part of a team, um, Professor Helen Dulk at the front, Dr Joanne Given at the front and Katie Carnell um, all worked with me on this particular piece of work together with uh, Elizabeth Nelson Gorman who can't be with us today. And um, I should say at the beginning that uh, Robert mentioned all the different universities that were involved in the KESS seminar series. And we, as a team, while we're Ulster-based, are part of wider teams across Ulster and Queen's University. So the ADRC is the Administrative Data Research Centre, which is joint between Queen's and Ulster, Ulster and is part of a bigger um, UK-wide network, the Administrative Data Research Network. Um, the other team that we're uh, representing today is ARC, which is a research centre that's joined between Queen's and Ulster University. Uh, and I'll mention a little bit about the Life and Times, or not a little bit, I'll be talking about the Life and Times survey, um, which ARC runs uh, as we go on. The other thing that's very important to say is that the research that we're presenting today was funded by the Northern Ireland Health and Social Care Research and Development Division of the Public Health Agency, and we're very grateful to them for their support. Okay, so everybody here will be very well aware that data about us is collected in a lot of different ways. So when we get a new driving license, when we go to the doctor, when we buy things. So there's a lot of data and a lot of administrative data that's, that's being gathered uh, about us. And there's also other research data through surveys and so on that, that's been gathered. What we're interested in doing is looking to see how we can link some of this administrative data together to help us understand some of the major social policy and health issues um, that, that society faces. And if we can do that uh, in, a, in, in a robust way, then administrative data-based research can really add value to what we know about some of our key issues. And we'll talk about some of the examples uh, as, we, as we go on. So effective linking and sharing of medical and other social data for research has great potential for the public good. But on the other side, um, it poses challenges in terms of... Um, right to privacy and the, the dangers associated with people being able to access, access information. So we have to look at those challenges in terms of protecting individual privacy as well. Um, and because the data that we're interested in is about the public, it's about all of us, we have to understand what the public understand about data sharing and data linking and about administrative data and these sorts of things and what is their opinion on how we should proceed in terms of sharing data, linking data and allowing researchers access to data. So these are very important things and the ADRC is is working across the two universities and with the data acquisition and protection specialists at NISRA to look at Northern Ireland administrative data and to see, um, uh, uh, to make some of that available uh, for research purposes. So when the ADRC was set up, we were uh, very concerned with public engagement mm -hmm. and uh, making sure that the public understood what uh, using administrative data meant and so on. And as part of the work of the ADRC in Northern Ireland, we have a public engagement uh, committee. And we thought, actually, it would be really interesting to know something about what the public thinks. Because there had been some qualitative research done in terms of focus groups, trying to monitor uh, and assess people's understanding. But there had been no <laughs> survey-based work that would give us a bigger picture uh, about people's um, knowledge and understanding. So in Northern Ireland, some of you may know that we run the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey Series, which has been running since 1998. It monitors attitudes and behaviours of people in Northern Ireland and it comprises of different modules from year to year. So in 2015, with support from our funder, we were able to include a module of questions relating to data sharing. 
And those questions took some time to design and agree, but they were derived uh, mainly from the dialogue on data report from the ESRC and Ipsos Mori that was carried out in 2014. I don't want to spend too much time talking about the survey, but some of you will want to know what it's, uh, how it gets its participants and the procedures. So Northern Ireland Life and Time survey is based on a systematic random sample of addresses from the postal address file. And within that uh, address, the person to be interviewed is randomly selected using the next birthday rule. So the interviews then are conducted with adults aged 18 years or over, and in 2015, the interviews were carried out uh, between September and December and resulted in 1,202 completed interviews. So the interviews are carried out face-to-face -face in the respondent's home via computer-assisted personal interviewing. And in the little policy brief that we've given you, we've given you a link to where you can actually uh, see the data, access the data yourself, see lay-friendly tables, um, see the questionnaires and see the technical reports. So all that detail is in the policy brief if you, if you want to... Uh, know any more. So when we were interested in uh, trying to explore public opinions, attitudes and understanding about administrative data, about data sharing, we decided we would start with a, um, a, 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 a we decided that a way in would be to ask how much people trust government and organisations to keep their data secure and to use it appropriately. So I don't know if you can see this very clearly. But basically, um, when we asked this question, um, how much people trusted organisations to keep information or data that they have about people secure and use it appropriately, uh, I think our GPs will be happy to know that 91% of us um, believed that the GP surgery would keep our data secure. The 86% uh, believed the NHS would do so. 73% government departments. 72% academic researchers in a university. And then this dropped quite significantly to 51% for charities and even further then for commercial organisations. So overall, I think from the perspective of um, health data, the, the very high uh, confidence that people had in the NHS and in our GP surgeries is, is um, good to note. 42% of the people who took part in the survey said they had ever had a concern about their public data being used. So of those roughly 4 in 10 respondents who expressed a concern, these were the sorts of things they were concerned about. So it's in, uh, in order of what was the most important and the, the first um, thing that people were concerned about is I think they will use my information for other purposes that they won't tell me about. So that was uh, quite an important concern. Another one was that we might lose or they might lose information to hackers, might lose information by accident. Um, I don't think they will use the information for my personal benefit. Um, sorry, I just noticed the end of the sentence is not, is not coming up there, so um, uh, let me just read that out again. So, they might lose my information by accident. I don't think they will use my information for, for my personal benefit. I don't think I would be able to change my information if it is wrong. I don't trust them to keep accurate records about me. I don't trust them at all and my personal information may be used to discriminate against me. So I think we can probably all um, sympathise with some of those concerns, and it is important to note what are the things that are in the public's mind about uh, using data. So from those beginnings, we went on then to look at attitudes towards government sharing information to improve its own services. So this is sharing information. And some of you will be aware of the electronic care record that was introduced in Northern Ireland in 2013. So this allows a patient's care record, uh, which might include things like details of blood tests, x-rays, prescriptions, etc., uh, to be available. So, for example, if someone's involved in a car crash and rushed to hospital, then the doctors, nurses and staff there can access the record and see if this person has a particular issue that needs to be taken uh, into account as they provide treatment for the emergency situation they're presented with. 
And 98% of us find that system acceptable in an emergency situation. Even when it's not an emergency situation, we're happy for government to share data within the health system. 96% find this system acceptable in a non-emergency situation. So there's very high levels of support, and I think that makes sense. Um, we can all understand where people are coming from for that. But this is the first public data that we have to support, um, or, or I should say the first random data we have from across the population to show that support about the electronic care record. So you'll see then as we move on, um, that's sharing within the health system. What about if we're going to share data outside of the NHS? How does the public feel about that? So basically, this is where um, we could pass health data to another government department to try to improve services. Now, we built up a number of different examples about this, and I'm, I'm, we don't have time today to go into all the detail. But one example uh, where we found high levels of support is that 80% thought it would be acceptable to pass on information who have a long, about people who have a long-term physical illness to benefit offices so they could be encouraged or helped to apply for the disability benefits to which they might be eligible. So there's a high level of support for that sort of sharing to... to um, improve services. Now, when we changed this, the, the situation and asked uh, about sharing information about children, the percentage of people who supported that dropped a little bit. And similarly, when we asked about mental health related issues, it dropped as well. And again, we've referred you to the data and uh, some of the findings are in another research update that we've circulated as well. So we can look at that. So we've now looked at general trust in organisations, we've looked at sharing within the health service and we've look, begun to look at sharing outside of, the, of, the, of the, the service to other departments for service reasons. But our big interest was in terms of when we came to link data for use by academic researchers. So this is at the core of um, our particular interest in the ADRC. What do people think about health data being shared or used by academic researchers? And there's a number of different concerns that immediately spring to mind that we tried to get um, a sense of from the public. So uh, let me just move that. Um, so we found that public support and tolerance for sharing data is nuanced. It's um, perhaps that's not a surprise. Support can be complicated or situation dependent. And we found three particular things that I'll talk about in more detail, but just to flag up at the beginning. We found that trust in organisations, the data protection measures and public benefit support data sharing for research purposes. If any of these are taken away or reduced, public support falls. And conversely, if energy is put into one of these domains but not in others, then it's not enough to secure public support. So I'll come back to that uh, in a minute. So the public might be concerned about whether or not consent has been given, um, whether or not the data contains information that identifies actual individuals, and whether the purpose of the research is to contribute to solving a particular problem. That is, that the research has a clear um, social benefit that respondents see significant. So consent is a complicated issue, and we could speak all afternoon about consent, but sometimes you'll have been part of um, something where you'll have been asked, would you be, would you be happy for your information to be used for X research purpose? But you'll understand that with a lot of administrative data, that specific consent, it's just not possible to get it. Okay, because you've got millions, maybe millions of people in this um, particular set of data and um, you may not know when you're collecting the data that at some point down the line you're going to want to do research on some aspect of this. So how do you get individual consent uh, for particular examples? So that is, is one of the issues. The other thing is about data security. So sometimes we hear about um, somebody leaving a laptop in the back of a London taxi and data suddenly being accessible. Um, obviously, people are concerned about their data, where it's stored. And if we're talking about trying to share data, we need to consider how we do that in a secure way so that there is no risk or uh, 
as little risk as absolutely possible that any individual or identifying information can come across. So that's another important issue. Um, and uh, that's linked then into whether or not the data is identified. Are there names on the data? Are there dates of birth? Are there addresses or things like that that could potentially um, identify us? Or is the data de-identified? Have names been taken off and other identifying information been stripped away? So that's something that people would have a concern about. And finally, then, we'll look in more detail now, but public benefit. Do people understand what the potential value of linking this data is and what it might mean to our understanding of perhaps a particular illness or a particular um, situation? that if we were able to research it, that we could answer a question better and we could direct services better or we could um, more support people who are facing those, those situations. So very important issues um, that I know um, you'll all uh, be familiar with. So before I move to the next slide, I suppose one of the, the big findings and one of the ones we'd like you to take away with you is that overall we found 85% of people agree if personal data can be made anonymous and a person's right to privacy maintained, then the data should be used where there is a clear benefit to society. So that's one of the sort of top line findings that, that came out of this research. Um, it was fun trying to design this survey and uh, trying to ask a general question just didn't seem to work as we were piloting and developing the instrument. So what we did was we developed quite specific scenarios so that the respondents were actually being given a situation, that, a concrete situation that they could hopefully uh, engage with and make a decision about. I'm not, again, we don't have time to go into the details of all the scenarios, but this is one that, that um, we came up with that we think um, did relate well to our respondents. So suppose some university researchers are studying the causes of Parkinson's disease. They are allowed to see bits of health records, including medical information about patients, as well as their age, their sex, and their occupation. But they are not allowed to see names, addresses, or postcodes. But the researchers are very keen to know roughly where the patients live, because some people think there is a link between Parkinson's disease and living near fields where pesticides have been used. So this is a scenario explaining how different sets of data could come together, the data, the um, agricultural data around um, uh, spraying of fields with pesticides and the health data. So we offered um, our respondents uh, some uh, opportunity to comment on this and we found 87% were happy for NHS staff to link the postcodes to agricultural data. The NHS staff to remove the postcodes and pass that data to researchers. So where the anonymization, if you like, and taking away the identifying information was being done within the health service, we had very high levels of support, 87%. Now, we asked, what about if the NHS just gave that data to researchers and wanted, uh, allowed them to do that linking? Um, and that uh, percentage of support dropped to 60%. So 60% of people said yes when the NHS uh, staff would pass patients' postcodes to researchers so they could link. So people were very clearly more secure when they felt the data was not going outside the NHS. The issue of consent I have referred to briefly earlier. So what did the public say about the issue of consent when using data for research? Now we asked this question after um, a number of questions with scenarios, etc. In this question, we did not specifically say anonymized data. So we basically asked um, uh, a, a general question about the need for consent. And I think um, when we first looked at the data, it's very unusual to get such a, such a very um, clear breakdown. So we, we found three different um, groups of people. 30% who think it isn't necessary to ask for consent for linking data in these ways, as long as they're a guarantee that nobody will be identified. <laughs> So a third uh, felt it wasn't necessary to ask for consent. 34% said you should always try to get consent when you can, but if the difficulties are too great, 
uh, important research should not be abandoned for this reason. So that's another third of our sample who felt you should try, but if you can't, we can still get on with the important uh, research that we need to do. And finally, we had another third who said, you should always have to ask for individual patients' consent before linking their data with anything else, uh, and you will have to abandon the research if there are difficulties contacting people. So that's an interesting split. You might be interested to know that the 31% of people who felt you could not do the work unless you'd got explicit consent. Unsurprisingly, of the people who'd said initially way back at the beginning that they didn't trust the NHS, 53% of them uh, were of this opinion. So the people, the people who, um, who were lacking in trust generally fed into this group. Also important to note, uh, and again, I, I don't, we don't have time to go into all the different breakdowns and, and uh, analyses that we did, but 38% of the people who felt you always had to get cons consent had no qualifications, no educational qualifications, and 50% um, uh, identified themselves as strong nationalists. So those are just some of the interesting subgroups that, that, that we found. Now, within the ADRC, we have um, very, very tight uh, security measures to safeguard the data that we use uh, for academic research. And we asked the public what their views were about these safeguards. And we found very high levels of support for all of these measures that, that, uh, that we actually implement within the ADRC. So firstly, researchers are vetted. A person cannot just come to NISRA and uh, say, I want to use X data set. You have to be vetted. Your application has to go forward to a panel uh, and be uh, selected and approved. Identifiers must be removed from the data. So in our case, there is no identification uh, on the data. The research must have a clear public benefit. Um, and we're not talking today about some of the information we got about commercial uh, organizations, but primary focus for uh, our survey was around public benefit and the, the public perception of such. Uh, people were supportive of the idea of there being penalties if researchers breach data security, official approval. Importantly, the research must be done in dedicated secure areas. So, I, I, probably everybody in this room is aware that we could not just get a data set from uh, the Department of Health or the Department of Education. We would go to a secure data center in NISRA where the data would be available on a machine that was not uh, connected to the internet or anything else. You could do your work and your analysis and then you would have to um, take your results away but you would not be taking the data away. Okay, so very secure access. This is not a case of data being sent to people to work on or anything like that. Um, if your project is approved and you've been vetted uh, and got the approvals, then you would go to the secure data center to do your work. And very importantly, and I think important for us as academic researchers, people want to see the results. They don't want us to do the research and publish a paper and put it in our CV uh, and never, never hear anything more about it. People want to know what their data has been used for and to see the, the results from that. So we were uh, pleased that all of these safeguards that we have in place were very clearly supported by the public. Uh, and again, just to reiterate then, um, sorry, I have lost my place. Um, what I said earlier, if personal data can be made anonymous and a person's right to privacy maintained, then the data should be used where, is the, where there is a benefit to society. So this suggests to us that the public, if they are fully informed about what's, uh, what's happening, what the use of the research is, what the security measures are, that there is support for data sharing for, uh, for research purposes. And as I said earlier, then, just a, a sort of diagram to um, show the pillars of support. So public support is dependent upon the trust we have in organisations, the perception of public benefit, and the data protection measures. So 
Um, given the value that um, for, given the value for health and societal well-being that can be generated from research using administrative linked data, we recommend that MLAs should um, attempt to maintain and raise support for data sharing. So how, how could MLAs do that? Um, how could they increase public trust? Perhaps they could be part of an education programme to educate their constituents on data use and data sharing. Make sure that the public understand that, that opt-out me mechanisms may be available uh, where possible without imposing unworkable consent requirements. Remember, consent is not always possible with administrative data. Um, you may be interested in contacting some of the ADRC researchers to learn more about our systems uh, for protecting privacy and securing data. And then, with your increased understanding of the work that we're trying to do, you may be able to help to take action to make more data available for research, to speak with your government, department leadership and civil servants and encourage the data sharing process. And speaking with my own uh, life and times and our cat on, I think it is important that we continue to engage with the public and try to understand where they are in terms of understanding about this issue uh, and their concerns and um, make sure that they are kept fully informed going forward. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we're taking questions at the end and I'm very happy to answer them or my colleagues will as well.